oximetry. And I don't have pulse oximetry here on the table with me, but we would always put a pulse oximeter on the patient. And that's something that we all, all, almost automatically do when a patient comes in. Yeah? Pulse oximetry. So that's our FIVE. We then move on to G, which stands for give comfort. The comfort that we might consider giving him might be verbal reassurance. It could be physical touch. It might be to just elevate a, a sore limb. It might be to put an ice pack on. It might be to give some morphine with a doctor's order or some fentanyl with a doctor's order. It might be as easy as just having the family come and sit and hold his hand. Any of those things that are going to reduce anxiety or promote his comfort are considered G for give comfort and they're required. H is our history. I want to find out from the mates exactly what happened. I want to find out the M-I-V-T. M was mechanism of the injury. What, what injury did he sustain? We, the mates won't know, but if I'd asked the ambulance, they might have been able to tell me at the scene he had a, a broken leg and a, and a sore arm and a, a chest injury. Yeah? Uh, I might be um, what, so they were the injuries that happened. M was the mechanism of injury, how the injury actually took place. Oh, he was in a rollover or he crashed a motorcycle. Or in this guy's case, he fell off a ute when they were doing circle work. V was the vital signs that the ambulance could have taken. Uh, what, what blood pressure did the ambulance get? What was his uh, OBS like at the scene of the accident? Because just a couple of minutes ago, I took a set of OBS on him now, and I want to compare. Is the patient deteriorating or is the patient improving? And T, did the ambulance do any T treatment? Did they give him first aid? Did they put a, put a splint on him? Did they put cannulas in? Did they put a collar on him? What did they do for him? And how did he respond to that? If the patient was awake or if family were present, I might be able to find out if he's got any allergies, if he's on any medication of any sort, if he's got any past medical history that might be relevant to this person's case. You know, I want to know if he's a haemophiliac. Don't I? Or I might want to know if he if he's subscribes to one of those religions that prohibits blood transfusion. So, so relevant history is, is, is required at this point. I want to know when he last ate or drank, and I want to know if there was any alcohol on board or drugs or any events that surrounding the, uh, the incident that might be relevant to this guy's management. We then move to our head to toe. The head to toe, as the name implies, starts at the head. I'm just going to move this... Uh, for the moment. We start with our head to toe by feeling across the patient's forehead and scalp for obvious signs of bogginess or crepitus or injury. We then move down the bridge of the nose. We feel underneath their eyes and across the top of their maxilla. We feel across their jaw. We look and inspect the ears and behind the ears for bleeding or bruising, the nose for bleeding or bruising. We again look at the eyes and we inspect the eyes for any obvious trauma. And we just make a mental note of that to record later. Or we could just say that to our, our team member that was doing the, the documenting. We then move down to our neck. And again, I want to feel any stepping off deformity in the patient's neck. I want to feel again the patient's trachea and carotids again. And I want to see if the jugular veins are distended or flattened. I move down to the neck. Uh, sorry, to the chest. With the chest, I'm going to feel across the clavicles, the first and the second ribs, and I'm going to march my fingers down the sternum of the patient. As I said before, these bones are very difficult to break. If they're broken, it represents a large amount of force, and it represents that this patient could have some severe underlying lung, heart, or great vessel trauma. I want to place my hands across the patient's chest and feel a couple of breaths to see if there's any disintegrity or crepitus in the chest wall itself. If, I could, if the patient has broken ribs, I might be able to feel that instability underneath my hands. The second time that I use the stethoscope will be again to listen to the patient's chest in exactly the same anatomic landmark, second intercostal space, midclavicular line, and at the fifth or sixth intercostal space in the midaxilla. I'll also listen over the fourth intercostal space in the midaxillary line on the left-hand side to the patient's heart sounds. And I'm expecting just two clear heart sounds. If it was muffled, I'd be concerned that I might have a patient with a pericardial tamponade. If it was more than two heart sounds, I might be concerned that I have a patient that had some, some problem with one of their valves. We move then down to the abdomen. Looking at the abdomen, I want to divide the abdomen into four quadrants through the umbilicus. I first inspect the abdomen to look for any signs of distension. 
might be an indicator of bleeding in the abdomen. I then listen, so we look, listen, feel, is the way that we do things. The technique is to look first, listen second, and I'm listening for normal bowel sounds in the abdomen. Absence of bowel sounds would be an abnormal finding, but is quite frequent in a trauma patient. After listening for bowel sounds, I would then palpate in each of the four quadrants, and what I'm trying to elicit is any pain response. Does this cause the patient to flinch? Does it cause the patient to have any rigidity? Is the patient's abdomen very, very tense and tight? We call that peritonism, and in the absence of bowel sounds, a patient with peritonism nearly always will be required to have um, abdominal surgery to, to detect the loss of, um, of blood or the loss of bowel contents. A perforated bowel may be the, the case. We then move down to the patient's pelvis. We're going to put pressure on the patient's pelvis, the iliac crest, towards the midline as though I was squeezing in this direction to see if the pelvis was intact. I would have inspected the perineum before I put the IDC in. Uh, if I hadn't, then now would be the time to inspect the perineum for any bleeding, blood at the urethral meatus, vagina, penis, in the scrotum, the swollen vulva, or any discharge from the rectum at all. If the patient had priapism, then that might be a significant finding that would indicate a high spinal injury. We move down from the pelvis, making sure that that urine, that IDC is draining and it's nice and clear. We would be expecting 30 mils an hour minimum from our trauma patient. We want to completely inspect and palpate each limb. So we are circling the person's limb with our hands, feeling the entire limb. We want to feel for pulses, and we look at capillary refill, colour warmth movement sensation. Same on the opposite side. Again, feeling pulses, capillary refill. If the patient was awake and alert, I found that uh, <laughs> pulse oximeter. <laughs> if the patient was awake and alert, then it would be reasonable to ask them to wriggle their toes. Can they feel me squeezing their toes, can they feel this toe, can they feel that toe. Moving to their arm again, being mindful we must keep the patient warm. We're going to feel the patient's limb, again take their pulses, capillary refill, if the patient again was awake and alert ask them to squeeze your hand, we're checking for power. We'd also when we get to the arms check to see to make sure that the patient's uh, IV line was still running, that it was still patent. Again on this side, have we still got IV patency, inspect and palpate the entire limb, again pulses and capillary refill. That completes the head to toe assessment of the patient. The last part of the puzzle is that somebody will take the head, a collar should be placed onto the patient if it hadn't been previously in, uh, applied, and the patient with two or three staff minimum on the side should be log rolled, and then we would inspect and palpate the posterior surface and put a finger in the anus with the doctor's okay or usually the doctor will do that to check for anal sphincter tone. That completes the primary and the secondary assessment of a trauma patient.